street miss green all rolled into one. Let me save you the stress of searching too far. There is one certified experience on standing by the front door. That's probably why they left me for the last anyway. Well, meet Joshua. Meet Joshua. Joshua is the typical street kid. He's already abusing substances, and I mean hard drugs. He's also spending his time, you know, searching the rubbish bins, looking for what valuable he may find. And the stench from his clothes are enough to extinguish your very costly perfume. Well, the automatic response when anybody meets Joshua is to shun him or pretend as though they didn't see him. But something in me would not dare to hold that line. And imagine, as I began to try to speak with Joshua, I found out that he couldn't even speak complete English sentences. Joshua didn't know what the date was. He didn't even know what his, when his birthday was. I'd, I'd like to see one of those experiences when I tried, you know, getting information out of Joshua. So imagine talking with Joshua for two hours with that kind of cut and join sentences. And as I made sense out of his incomplete sentences, it was more of an emotional experience for me and not just exchange of words. Joshua had was, was left out to the streets at age 13 because his dad had died. And I could not help but remember the story of James, the, the thief, the cheat, and the street miscreant. You see, I was born into a very loving home, a very, very loving home. My, my father was a businessman and my mom a primary school teacher. Both of them earned enough money to keep us on a moderate economic path in our, in our family. And I was the typical, I mean, child from a Nigerian family because my mom wouldn't even let me play with the kids outside. She'd rather that I read storybooks and spend my time rightly. I saw a lot. As a child, I dreamed. I dreamed of the future. I dreamed of so many things. I wanted to be a doctor. But in 2006, things began to spiral out of control in our home. My dad began to get involved in local politics and my parents began to quarrel very incessantly. One night that is very difficult to erase from my memory was this night when I had been tucked into bed under a very comfy blanket and there must be something wrong with you. My dad's voice turned out in the living room and the next thing that followed was BAM! BOOM! BOOM! And an eerie scream followed that only suggested beating. I nearly peed in my pants that night. But I wasn't allowed to get out of bed. From the interventions of the neighbors, my dad was forced to leave the house he had to leave that night, of course, to calm the tension down. The next morning when I woke up, I walked into the living room and I saw my mom's bath parked in the in the parlor. And I saw her with teary eyes, asking me, James, how was your night? While she was mopping a deep cut on her hand. 2007, things grew worse, and my parents finally separated. I thought that was, I mean, for me, amidst the mixed feelings, it was, it, I was glad because, well, the fighting had stopped, and I was with my mom. And mom is a boy, by the way. So, that only lasted for a very short time. I thought it was going to last forever, you know, being with mom, being away from the fighting. Unfortunately, not too long, about seven months later, my dad came calling for custody of me and my elder brother while he began the proceedings for a divorce. The next season of my life was the most traumatic season ever, something I wouldn't wish for any child to experience. I was left to myself, my dad was never around, and I dropped from being top of the class to the last in the class, and that, that was when it dawned on me that the only thing that was necessary for a child to drop and almost drop out of school was a divorce. 
I began to make friends with the wrong people. I mean, without parental guidance or care. I would hang out with this group, and we had a lot of tales. We did a lot of terrible things. I'd like to share one with you. So one day, a group of boys in the streets agreed that they, we were, ag we agreed, I inclusive, that we were going to go and shoplift. We were going to go to a shop and steal. And the agreement was everybody make a way with what you can. So whatever you get is yours. And even though I was afraid, I couldn't back out. It was a very terrible experience. So everybody had made a way with their bounty very swiftly, and I was the last guy, just like here again. And, <laughs> and you know what happened? As I, my plan was to just you know, act as though I was going to buy stuff, and then when nobody's watching, just swiftly disappear. And as I took that biscuit and put it in my pocket, I heard a voice. 99 years for the thief, one day for the woman. And it wasn't, it wasn't the voice of an angel, it wasn't my mind. And the man smacked me before he handed me over to the shopkeeper. They asked me to kneel down. They were very gracious. They didn't touch me. They asked me to kneel down in front of the store while people came and buy, came to buy and sell. And I just knelt down there and prayed that the ground would open and swallow me, or nobody I knew would come to the shop to buy something. It was very terrible, and things continued like this until two. 2011, when I met a young man, and like Michael, Michelangelo, he said, I see an angel in the storm. And that encounter with him changed my life forever. He mentored me off that strange path. And before I knew it, I was on my way back with my life again. Three years down the line, James meets Joshua. And I could not help but do something about this problem. I saw myself in Joshua's eyes, and that is why I saw the possibility that Joshua could be something better. I founded an organization at 15 called Street Priest Incorporated. Next slide. And we have a vision to transform the lives of street children and have their potential turned into assets for society. I mean, when I met Joshua, I was just 15 with pocket money. How much good can I do? So I ask you today, you waiting to have a house or have a big business before you help out, how much good can you do today? And when I met Joshua, all I had to give at first was a listening ear. That was all I had to give. Nobody listens to Joshua. He smells, he stinks, he's a, he's a thief, he's a cheat. He steals occasionally. Why would anyone want to listen to him? I listened to his story. And that immediately registered in his heart that there's one person in this world who cares. I began to help out with my pocket money by getting food. And very soon, my friends who make up for the core team of street priests now joined in. And together, we were able to get Joshua back to school in primary two. Next slide, please. He had to start from primary two because that was Joshua right there. And he had to start from primary school. But primary two, even though he was 13, he couldn't read or, or write, so he had to start and it was very difficult. But today, next slide. Next slide. This is a team that make up the core members of Street Priests. Next slide. Joshua had to start from Mary 2 at age 13. Next slide. And today, in junior secondary school one, he can read, he can write, and last time he came to his class. <laughs> Joshua is just one of 300 other street kids that we have been able to take off the streets by the efforts of our young NGO. Next slide, please. And we've been able to get several hundreds of other kids back to school who are on the verge of being on the streets through our own efforts. Now, if there is anything you take away from this talk today, it is this. Nobody wants to be told that how they're living is wrong. Nobody wants to be told that they are a nuisance, their existence is unnecessary. They know. We all want that person who would walk us through our struggles, and we all deserve that person. And if you've ever been a child, as I assume that you have been, because you're sitting here today, you've been touched by someone. Whether it was your parents, it was a stranger, it was your guardian, you've been touched by someone. Hence, you've been empowered to touch some other person. Next slide. 
And so the next time you meet a James, a Joshua, or a Janet, as I assume you will, because there are over 100 million street kids out there in the world, what would you do? Would you look at that stone and see the angel waiting to be touched by you? Or you push them away? And if you listen and care like you just did, I mean, who thought that one day people would buy tickets to watch me speak? And if you listen and care like you just did, you would find out that I'm not such a thief, a cheat, or a miscreant after all. Thank you.